Question. Which client does the nurse assess first after receiving morning report? 1. Client one day postoperative with intragenous eye patient controlled analgesia PCA who reports burning at the eye site. 2. Client with a bowel obstruction prescribed continuous nasogastric suction who was admitted yesterday. 3. Client with atrial fibrillation and an irregular heart rate of 94 per min. 4. Client with dementia and Clostridium difficile C. difficile, who was incontinent of liquid stool. Explanation. Option 1 is correct. The nurse assesses the client who reports burning at the PCO I've site first. The analgesia runs through a special PCO administration set that is attached to the PCO pump. It is attached to a running IV line, which is on its own infusion pump, to flush the PCO drug through the IV line each time a dose is administered. If the IV line infiltrates the subcutaneous tissue, or the catheter becomes occluded, the PCA drug can back up into the primary tubing each time a dose administered, resulting in inadequate pain control. In addition, burning can indicate phlebitis, which causes vessel wall injury, and can lead to thrombophlebitis. Option 2. The nurse will perform abdominal and pain assessments and will check the function and patency of the suction. However, this client was admitted yesterday's stable, and does not need to be assessed first. Option 3, an irregular heart rhythm is to be expected in a client with atrial fibrillation and a heart rate of 94 per minute, is within the normal range to 60 to 100 per minute. This client is stable, and does not need to be assessed first. Option 4, incontinence of stool in a client with dementia, and C. difficile is not uncommon. To provide for immediate client comfort, the nurse can delegate the task of beijing the client to the unlicensed assistive personnel. This client does not need to be assessed first. Educational objective. To prioritize care, the nurse first identifies the type of problem, associated complications, and desired outcomes. The nurse then decides which client problems and needs are most urgent and require immediate action and which can be delayed. Question. The nurse in an outpatient clinic is caring for a client with Addison disease who has been taking hydrocortisone 20 mg daily for the last eight years. Which client data most important to report to the healthcare provider? 1. Blood pressure of 140 over 90 mm HV. 2. Low-grade fever of 100.4 Fahrenheit 38 Celsius. 3. Mild increase in fasting blood glucose. 4. Weight gain of 6 pounds, or 2.7 kg in 3 months. Explanation. Option 2 is correct. Addison disease primary adrenocortical insufficiency is characterized by a deficiency in all three types of adrenal steroids a glucocorticoids androgens, mineralocorticoids, most commonly caused by an autoimmune response. Corticosteroid therapy. Hydrocortison. Dexamethasin prednison is the primary treatment for Addison disease. Long-term use of corticosteroids can cause immunosuppression, and the antiminous inflammatory effects may also mask signs of infection, inflammation, redness, tenderness, heat, fever, edema. Signs and symptoms of infection, low-grade fever, should be reported to the healthcare provider immediately as infection can develop quickly and spread rapidly option two. In addition, physiological stress such as infection can trigger a dyspnean crisis, a life-threatening complication, Addison disease, that would require an increase in the corticosteroid dose. Options 1, 3, and 4 side effects of long-term corticosteroid therapy mimic the signs and symptoms of Cushing syndrome, including buffalo hump, moon-shaped face, and hypokalemia. Increased weight, blood pressure, and blood glucose levels can also occur, however, these effects are not as life-threatening as infection. Educational objective. In clients taking corticosteroids, it is imperative to notify the healthcare provider of signs and symptoms of infection, even a low-grade fever. The anti-inflammatory properties of corticosteroids can mask signs of infection, and their immunosuppressive effects can cause the infection to develop and spread quickly. Question. The nurse is assessing an infant with intussusception. Which of the following clinical findings should the nurse expect? Select all that apply. 1. Palpable olive-shaped mass in epigastrium. 2. Palpable sausage-shaped abdominal mass. 3. Projectile vomiting without visualized blood. 4. Screaming and drawing of the knees up to the chest. 5. 
stall mixed with blood and mucus. Explanation. Option 245 are correct. Intussusception is an obstructive gastrointestinal disorder caused when a segment of the bowel slides or telescopes into another section. This typically occurs infants and children aged below 6. Once the bowel telescopes in pressure increases within the bowel causing ischemia and leakage of blood and mucus into the lumen of the bowel. Classic clinical manifestations of intussusception include episodes of sudden crampy abdominal pain, palpable sausage-shaped abdominal mass, and red currant jelly stools options 2 and 5. Other manifestations include inconsolable crying with the knees drawn up to the chest and vomiting option 4. The child may appear normal and calm between painful episodes. Options 1 and 3. A palpable epigastric olive-shaped mass and non-bloody projectile vomiting are up to 3 to 4 feet 1 meter, a clinical manifestations often seen with pyloric stenosis. Projectile vomiting may also be a symptom of elevated intracranial pressure. However, intussusception typically causes bilious non-projectile vomiting and involves a sausage-shaped mass. Educational objective. Classic symptoms of intussusception include sudden, crampy abdominal pain, a palpable sausage-shaped abdominal mass current jelly stools, inconsolable crying with the knees drawn up to the chest, and bilious non-projectile vomiting. An olive-shaped mass is characteristic of pyloric stenosis. Projectile vomiting is frequently associated with pyloric stenosis or increased intracranial pressure. Question. The nurse on the medical unit finishes, receiving the change of shift handoff report at 7.30 a.m. Which assigned client should the nurse see first? One. Client with a gastrointestinal bleed, who is receiving a unit of packed red blood cells. 2. Client with an ulcerative colitis flare-up has temperature 101 Fahrenheit 38.3 Celsius, and abdominal cramping. 3. Client with atrial fibrillation on telemetry, prescribed warfarin with an international normalized ratio INR of 3.2. 4. Client with chronic kidney disease scheduled for bedside hemodialysis at 8 a.m. with a serum creatinine of 8.4 mg slash or 743 mu mol per liter. Explanation. Option 1 is correct. The nurse should check on the assigned clients in the following order. 1. Client with the gastrointestinal bleed receiving packed red blood cells, PRBCS the nurse should. Check the infusion device, flow rate, and I've cite tubing and filter. Collect baseline physical assessment data against which to compare subsequent assessments. Assess for complications associated with the administration of PRBCS, which include fluid overload and an acute transfusion reaction. These can occur at any time during the transfusion. 2. Client with chronic kidney disease scheduled for dialysis in 30 minutes the nurse should perform a baseline assessment before dialysis is initiated. The nurse should then prepare the client by making sure the client eats breakfast, administering prescribed morning medications that are not dialyzed out, and holding those that are dialyzed out. Elevated creatinine level g normal 0.6 minus 1.3 mg slash or 53 minus 115 mu mol per liter is an expected finding. Option 4. 3. Client with ulcerative colitis with elevated temperature and abdominal pain is an inflammatory bowel disease fever and lower quadrant abdominal cramping are expected findings. After assessing the client, the nurse will administer an analgesic and an antipyretic as prescribed. Option 2. 4. Client with history of atrial fibrillation, prescribed warfarin coumadin, the client is on. Telemetry in most facilities, if dysrhythmias occur, the monitor technician slash nurse will notify the primary care nurse immediately. The goal INR is 2.0 to 3.0 for atrial fibrillation. An INR of 3.2 is expected when adjusting the warfarin dose. Option 3. Question. The nurse is assessing a 70-year-old client with a long history of type 2 diabetes mellitus for sudden severe nausea, diaphoresis dizziness, and fatigue in the emergency department. Which hospital protocol would be the most appropriate to follow initially? One. Food poisoning. 2. Influenza. 3. Myocardial infarction. 4. Stroke. Explanation. Option 3 is correct. Early recognition and treatment of heart attack are critical. 
Women, the elderly and clients with a history of diabetes may not have the classic heart attack symptoms of dull chest pain with radiation down the left arm. Instead, they can present with atypical symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, belching, indigestion, diaphoresis, dizziness, and fatigue. Option 1 Taking a careful history and evaluating for any sick contact would be helpful in identifying food poisoning, but a more important initial step is to assess for a heart attack. Option 2 A viral infection is a possibility, but fever and milder are usually present during an episode of influenza. Option 4 Early intervention in stroke is also critical, and a neurologic assessment would take place after the acute coronary syndrome algorithm especially with negative electrocardiography and serum heart enzyme levels. Educational Objective Myocardial infarctions in women, the elderly and diabetics may have gastrointestinal distress, as the main symptom this needs to be evaluated with the Institutional Protocol for Acute Coronary Syndrome. Question. During a routine clinic visit, the nurse is providing education to a 24-year-old female client with Marfan syndrome and aortic root dilation. Which statement made by the nurse is appropriate? 1. Call the healthcare provider to stop your beta blocker if pregnancy occurs. 2. If you plan to become pregnant, it is best to wait a few years and plan it at an older age. 3. It is important to consistently use a reliable form of birth control. 4. Your condition is not inheritable to your future children. Explanation. Optin 3 is correct. Marfan syndrome is a connective tissue disorder that causes visual and cardiac defects and a distinct long, slender body type. In Marfan syndrome with aortic vessel involvement, the root of the aorta is dilated or weakened increasing the risk of aortic dissection and aortic rupture. Increases in blood volume and cardiac workload that occur during pregnancy may worsen aortic root dilation and further increase the risk of aortic dissection slash rupture. Pregnancy in clients with Marfan syndrome, especially those with aortic root dilation poses a high risk of maternal mortality. Clients should be instructed about the importance of consistently using reliable birth control methods to prevent pregnancy. Option 1 Beta blockers are commonly used to treat clients with Marfan syndrome to limit aortic root dilation. Such medications are generally safe to use during pregnancy, so the client should not discontinue therapy unless directed to do so by the healthcare provider. Option 2. Clients with Marfan syndrome considering pregnancy should be counseled to complete childbearing in early adulthood because aortic root dilation and the risk of aortic dissection slash rupture increase with time. Option 4. Marfan syndrome is an autosomal dominant condition with a 50% chance of inheritance in offspring. Educational objective. Marfan syndrome affects the connective tissues and is associated with dilation of the aortic root. Clients with Marfan syndrome are at high risk of mortality during pregnancy due to the potential for aortic dissection. Consistent use of reliable birth control is essential for preventing pregnancy. Question. The nurse on a pediatric unit is caring for a preschooler who exhibits separation anxiety when the parents go to work. Which interventions should the nurse implement? Select all that apply. 1. Encourage the parents to leave the child's favorite stuffed animal. 2. Establish a daily schedule similar to the child's home routine. 3. Give the child time to calm down alone when visibly upset. 4. Provide frequent opportunities for play and activity. 5. Remove visual reminders of the parents from the room. Explanation. Option 1, 2, 4 are correct. Some of the first stressors faced by children from infancy through the preschool years are related to illness and hospitalization. Separation anxiety, also known as anaclytic depression, particularly affects children aged 6 to 30 months. There are three stages of separation anxiety protest when the child refuses attention from others, screams for the parent return, and cries inconsolably despair when the child is withdrawn quiet, uninterested in activities or meals, and displays younger behavior use of pacifier wetting the bed and detachment, when the child suddenly appears happy and interested in building relationships. Nursing care of hospitalized clients experiencing separation anxiety focuses on maintaining a calm environment and a supportive demeanor to build trust between the nurse and the child and encouraging connection with family and familiar environments, even when they are absent. Key interventions include encouraging the parents to leave favorite toys, books, and pictures from home. 
Establishing a daily schedule that is similar to the child's home routine. Maintaining a close calming presence when the child is visibly upset. Facilitating phone or video calls when parents are available. Providing opportunities for the child to play and participate in activities. Option 3. When the child is visibly upset, it is important to provide a calming presence and implement strategies to reduce the child's anxiety. Leaving the child alone at such times can further increase stress. Option 5. Providing pictures of the child's family is actually beneficial as it reminds the child of something familiar and safe. Question. The nurse is preparing to administer Ivcephazolin to a client with cellulitis. The client's allergies are listed as amoxicillin, ziprofloxacin, and sulfur drugs. What should the nurse do first? 1. Administer the medication as prescribed. 2. Clarify the prescription with the healthcare provider. 3. Inquire about the type of allergic reaction. 4. Notify the pharmacy that the drug is inappropriate. Explanation. Option 3 is correct. Clients with an allergy to penicillin antibiotics gamoxicillin and pisillin can possibly experience a cross-sensitivity reaction to cephalosporin antibiotics gacifazolin, cephalexin, ceftriaxone, because the drug molecules are structurally similar. The nurse should obtain more information about this client's reported allergies as reactions range from mild to severe. In particular, the nurse must first assess the type of reaction the client had amoxicillin option 3. The nurse should then clarify the prescription with the healthcare provider prior to administration. If this client's reaction to amoxicillin was a rash or other mild reaction that was not life minus threatening, the HCP may decide that cephalosporin can be safely administered. However, cephalosporins are contraindicated for a client with a history of anaphylactic reactions to penicillin and a different antibiotic should be prescribed. Option 1. The nurse should hold the medication until more is known about the client's reaction to amoxicillin. Option 2. The nurse must first obtain more information about the reaction, so the HC, P can make an informed decision about whether the cephalosporin antibiotic can be administered or should be changed. Option 4. The nurse must first obtain more information about the type of allergic reaction before notifying the pharmacy. Educational Objective. A client with a penicillin allergy may experience a cross-sensitivity reaction to cephalosporin antibiotics gacifazolin, cephalexin, ceftriaxone. Cephalosporins can typically be administered safely to clients with a history of mild allergic reaction rash, but are contraindicated in clients with a history penicillin anaphylaxis. Question. The initial prenatal laboratory screening results of a client at 12 weeks gestation indicate a rubella titer status of non-immune. What will the nurse anticipate as the plan of care for this client? 1. Administer measles mumps rubella MMR vaccine now. 2. Administer MMR vaccine immediately postpartum. 3. Administer MMR vaccine in the third trimester. 4. An MMR vaccine is not indicated for this client. Explanation. Option 2 is correct. In a pregnant client, a serum sample is collected at the first prenatal visit to determine immunity to the rubella gyrus. A positive immune response indicates immunity to the rubella gyrus attributed to either past infection or vaccination. A negative or non-immune response indicates that the client is susceptible to rubella disease and requires vaccination. An equivocal response indicates partial immunity to rubella and is treated clinically the same as non-immune status. Measles mumps rubella MMR is a live attenuated vaccine. Live vaccines are contraindicated in pregnancy due to the theoretical risk of contracting the disease from the vaccine. Maternal rubella infection can be teratogenic for the fetus. The fetal effects of congenital rubella syndrome include congenital cataracts, deafness heart defect patent ductus arteriosus, and cerebral palsy. The best time to administer an MMR vaccine to a non-immune client is in the postpartum period just prior to discharge option 2. The MMR vaccine can safely be administered to breastfeeding clients. Options 1 and 3, MMR vaccine is contraindicated pregnancy. Also, pregnancy should be avoided for at least 1 to 3 months after the immunization is given. Option 4, this client is rubella non-immune and is susceptible to rubella if exposed. The vaccine should be offered in the postpartum period. Educational Objective 
The measles, mumps, rubella vaccine is a live attenuated vaccine and is contraindicated in pregnancy due to the risk of teratogenic effects to the fetus. Clients who are non-immune to rubella should receive the vaccine the postpartum period. Pregnancy should be avoided for at least one to three months after immunization. Question. The nurse has provided education for a client newly prescribed alprazolam for generalized anxiety disorder. Which client statement indicates that teaching has been effective? 1. Eliminating aged cheeses and processed meats from my diet is essential. 2. I can skip doses on days that I am not feeling anxious. 3. I will take my daily dose at bedtime. 4. Using sunscreen is important as this drug will make me sensitive to sunlight. Explanation. Option 3 is correct. Benzaldiazepines galprazolam Xanax, lorispam ativan clonazpam, diazepam are commonly used anti-anxiety drugs. They work by potentiating endovenous GABA, a neurotransmitter that decreases excitability of nerve cells, particularly in the limbic system of the brain, which controls emotions. Benzaldiazepines may cause sedation, which can interfere with daytime activities. Giving the dose at bedtime will help the client sleep. Option 1 Eliminating aged cheeses and processed meats, which contain tyramine is necessary with monoamine oxidase inhibitors tranilsopromine, phenylzine, which are used for depressive disorders. It is not necessary with benzaldiazepines. Option 2 A benzaldiazepine should never be stopped abruptly. Instead, it should be tapered gradually to prevent rebound anxiety and a withdrawal reaction characterized by increased anxiety, confusion, and more. Option 4 Photosensitivity is a problem with most antipsychotics and many antidepressants, but not with benzaldiazepines. Educational Objective Benzaldiazepines have sedative effect and should be administered at bedtime when possible. Benzaldiazepines should never be stopped abruptly in long term users as this can precipitate withdrawal symptoms. Question The nurse is providing nutritional teaching for a client with a new ilostomy. Which foods should the nurse instruct the client to avoid? Select all that apply. 1. Bananas. 2. Broccoli with cheese. 3. Multigrain bagel. 4. Popcorn. 5. Spaghetti with sauce. Explanation. Option 2, 3, 4 are correct. An ilostomy is a cervically created opening stoma in the abdominal wall that connects the small intestine to the external abdomen. Stall from the small intestine bypasses the colon and exits through the ilostomy. Functions of the colon, fluid and electrolyte. Absorption vitamin K production do not occur resulting in liquid stool that drains into an external ostomy appliance attached to the skin. In the immediate post-operative period of an ilostomy, a low-residue diet low fiber is prescribed to prevent obstruction of the narrow lumen of the small intestine and stoma 1 in 2.54 cm diameter or less. After the ilostomy heals, the client reintroduces fibrous foods one at a time. The client is instructed to thoroughly chew food and monitor for changes in stool output. Foods to be avoided include high-fiber popcorn, coconut, brown rice, multi-grain bread options 3 and 4, stringy vegetables, celery, broccoli, asparagus option 2, seeds or pits, strawberries, raspberries, olives, edible peels, apple slices, cucumber, dried fruit. Option 1, after an ilostomy, a client may consume fruits and vegetables that are pitted, peeled, and slash, or cooked, peaches, bananas, potatoes. Option 5, low fiber carbohydrate options include white rice, refined grains and pasta. Educational objective. The low residue diet of a client with a new ilostomy helps prevent obstruction of the narrow lumen of the stoma. During the immediate post-operative period, the client should avoid foods that are high in fiber stringy vegetables and fruits and vegetables with pit seeds, or edible peels.